This is the fourth week of our series, Waymaker, leading up, of course, to next week, Easter. And I want to preach about today a message entitled, The King and Us. Everyone say, The King and Us. And uh, in this Palm Sunday, I'm going to read from Matthew 21. And uh, this Uh, These are the verses that describe the event that we're celebrating this week. And as I mentioned, uh, this started off what we call Passion Week, the last week of of Jesus' life before he was crucified and then raised from the dead. And Jesus fulfilled the smallest detail of prophecies in this event. In fact, uh, the book of Zechariah and Isaiah, 400 and 700 years before, prophesied about these details, and Jesus fulfilled them all. And so I would say this, Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies about him the first time he came, and he's going to fulfill all the prophecies the second time he comes too, because he's coming back for you and for me. How many believe he's coming back? I do. He's coming back. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 21, verses 7 through 11, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out three things that I see here in this passage that you and I can apply today in our response to the king. And the Bible says in verse seven, they brought the donkey and the colt to him and they threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Father, I thank you so much for this great worship. Please receive it. Please receive our worship today. We ask you for more Holy Spirit in this place and online. Keep us safe in this moment as we go about our week. I pray right now that all of us would lay down any resistance set aside any distractions, lean in for a few moments and receive something new from you today and apply it to our life. Jesus, we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. So we see here in this passage that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy and every detail of this was really forecasted in Jesus, he, he fulfilled it. And we see here the position of the king. And I want to just highlight this before I get into the things I'm seeing here for us today. Jesus is the king, and the Bible says that God changes not, and that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In fact, uh, the book of Revelation says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is set as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is who he says he is. Can someone say amen today? And he's reigning at the right hand of God. In fact, the Bible says he's praying for you and for me right now in Hebrews chapter 7. So he's the king, and we see in in this passage over 2,000 years ago, these people's response to the king. And in their response, we see our response that we can have today and transpose it to 2024 and apply it to our life. And that's what I want to focus on in our time today. We see here the first thing as we think about a Palm Sunday and what Jesus did. The first thing I see here for you and I is be available. Everyone say, be available, please. Be available. You know, they're saying right now in in athletics that the greatest ability is availability. Just being healthy, being able to show up and play every game and being counted on is a great ability. I believe in our faith of the same is true. One of the greatest things we can give Jesus is to be available. God, use me for your glory. I'm gonna show up. I'm here. I'm available. Do something in my life. Now, how do I see that in this passage? In verse seven, the Bible says that Jesus asked for a donkey and a colt, and he rode on the donkey into Jerusalem. This is significant, and I wanna break this down. Uh, The reason why is because in Bible days, if a king just got back from a conquest or just got back from a a, um, territory being expanded, he would always come in with the stallion. Uh, The animal of a king was a stallion, and that represented authority, dominance, 
It was really like this idea of I'm, a, I'm bowing down, like you're in charge. But a donkey represented humility and peace. And Jesus, notice he chose, and the Bible prophesied in the Old Testament that he would come in on a donkey, not a stallion. Notice he didn't come in parading himself saying, I'm in charge. Everyone bow to me. It was the opposite. He came on a donkey, which meant he was the humble servant. In fact, Philippians chapter two said he didn't lord it over people, but he was kind and humble. Jesus is a humble king. Jesus is a mighty king, but he did it by serving people. I love this about Christ. Donkeys in this day and age represented humility and peace versus the horse of conquest and war. Jesus came and he showed us something in this in this prophecy being fulfilled as to riding a donkey. He showed us the secret of what it takes to being available to God. Let me show you. How are you and I available to God? Just like that donkey, you and I are attractive to God when we are humble. Just like what the donkey represents in humility and how Jesus sat on the donkey. He was elevated above the people there and he was worshiped and admired. You and I can choose to be available, not by being boastful and prideful and getting on a stallion, so to speak, and look at me and look at my resume and look at my achievements and look at my knowledge and you know, look why I'm the better choice than other people and look what I've done. That doesn't get it to Jesus. What attracts Jesus to us is humility. It's saying, God, I need you. I'm weak without you. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. It's humility. That attracts Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So how are you and I available to God? Thank God none of us are donkeys in this room or online. Some of you will get that on the way home. Amen. None of us are donkeys, but, but we can take on the trait of humility. What if you and I, just stay with me, what if you and I would be like a donkey in that you and I would be like it was for Jesus and we would say, Jesus, any street I walk on, any place you take me to, any city I live in, you can stand on my shoulders. I will lift you high so that all people can see you. Jesus, I'm going to make you famous, not me. Jesus, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to glorify you. I want to be available and I'll just simply let you be on the stage of my life. I'll let you get the limelight. You can live through me. Stand on my shoulders. I want everyone to see you in me. This is what it means of being available. It's not being Billy Graham per se, because no one's going to be him. It's not being some superstar. It's simply shining like a star. And when you and I are humble, we can be available to God. It's like the old gospel song. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Take my heart. Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything. Lord, you can use me. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know where you're at in the journey of your faith, but being used by God is the greatest honor, greatest privilege, and greatest chance of a lifetime for the God of heaven to use people like you and I and do something profound through our life. And you and I are available, not necessarily by, uh, by our achievement or merit. Nothing wrong with that. You and I are available by our humility. I'm going to say this again. Pride makes excuses. Humility makes adjustments. What adjustments can you and I make so that we can be more available to God? Let me just make this real practical as we're in a religious holiday season of Easter. People are awakened this coming week to come to church. How about you and I, think about this. How about you and I in this room and online, how about all of us are available this week to pray for someone that you want to bring to church next week? Then we invite them to church. Then we go to their house, pull them out of bed, and bring them to church next Sunday, next Friday or Sunday. Yeah. Just get them. Say, well, that's not being spiritual. Oh, yes, it is. I heard this story recently by a great pastor and author named Lee Strobel, Pastor Lee Strobel. And he said several years ago uh, on Easter, around Easter, he had a friend that was a staunch atheist that had you know, this thriving career, and he just felt impressed. Go to this guy's work and invite your friend to Easter weekend. And so he did. He went to his work. He worked in his office, and he had other offices around his, and he invited his friend, and, and, and Pastor Lee said when he invited him, 
his friend very loudly, very bold, very brash, said, I'm never going to your church. I don't believe in your God. It's all fake. You know I'm an atheist. How dare you come in here and invite me? I'm your friend. I'm never going to your church. And just kind of chased him out. And Pastor Lee left and said, God, why did you have me do this? This was, you know, I mean, he was saying this didn't work. This is amazing. Four years later, four years later, on Easter weekend at Pastor Lee's church, a man and his whole family come up to him and they said, thank you for inviting us to church on Easter. I received Jesus, the husband said. My whole family has received Jesus and our lives are changed because of your invite. And Pastor Lee said, when did I invite you to church? You know, how did I do this? When did this happen? He said, four years ago, you went to your friend's office and you invited him to Easter weekend. You didn't see me. I was in the next office on the floor working on tile. And I heard your friend go off on you. But when you were talking about church, I felt, he said, now I know it's God. I felt something tell me that I needed God and I needed to come to church. So he said, I came to church four years ago on Easter and I received Jesus and my whole family has received Jesus and our life is changed. Come on. Isn't that powerful? A simple invite. So I'm just going to tell you, as you leave today, grab invites. Let's do this. Let's invite people to church. And, and, and let's be available around this religious holiday season. Be available and let God use you. And it may be someone you're inviting directly or in that story, you're really profound, someone he didn't even see in the area hearing and coming and being changed by the love of God. And I just want to say this, next week on Friday, we're going to have two services at 6 and 7.30, so you know kind of what's happening. And on Friday only, we'll have communion after each of the services at the 7.30 service, which is great for teenagers on Friday, because afterward, we're going to have a glow-in-the-dark egg hunt for teenagers. I don't know what that is, but it's going to be awesome for teens. So bring them. And then Sunday, 8.30, 10, 11.30, it's a great time to bring family and friends. City kids would be great. All five services it's going to be profound. Who can you invite? But what if you and I are just available and say, God, use me? You and I think at times I'm not spiritual. I don't know enough. I don't, I'm not close to God enough. This doesn't feel like God's in it, like Pastor Lee, as his friend berated him, but God was in it. And simply showing up and being available is profound. Just like the donkey, you and I can say, Lord, I'm available to you. What adjustments can you make? For God to use your life. Be available. This is our response to the king. The second thing I see here in verse 8 is simply you and I, we're not simply, this is a profound thing, but you and I make him king. Everyone say, make him king, please. Make him king. In verse 8, most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and cut branches from the trees. We know this is palm tree, which is why the kids symbol, I did that there in the, in the uh, fourth song, and spread them on the road. And so this was royal treatment, and again, we don't understand this in our Western culture, but in those days, in Bible days, when a king came back, uh, as he came into his city, they would cut palm branches and wave them as he went down the road. This was treatment only set aside for a king, and they would honor him, and that act was saying, you're the king, you're in charge, and they would you know, basically, in essence, a form of worship uh, to this king. And now in this passage, they took their of their outer garments off, their coats, put them on the ground, the donkey rode on top of their garment, and they were waving these palm branches. And what they were saying is, is Jesus, we make you king. You're the king. And really what the palm branches signify when a king came back into his city, it represented peace and victory. And they were celebrating that as a people. So when Jesus came in and they were waving palm branches and all that was happening, really they were saying, you're the king of peace and victory. For you and I today, obviously, we're not taking palm branches and waving them for Jesus physically. It's like, hey, I'm in Florida, palm branch for Jesus. Yay, hallelujah. You know, that's not what we're doing. But we are doing it internally within our heart. You and I, in our heart, can let Jesus be king. In fact, we're commissioned to making him king. What do I mean by that? Let's go a little step, I would say, clearer. When he's king, that means he's in charge of our life. He's boss. He decides what we do and don't do. He determines the boundaries of what's right and wrong. He dictates the pattern of our life. He is the king. Not a vote, not a democracy. 
It's a theocracy. He's in charge. And we commit our lives to him. This is a big deal. I know you're looking at me crazy, but I'm, I'm preaching good anyhow. He, he, he's the king. In fact, every day in my life, today, real early, I said this prayer out loud. I say this every day. Jesus, today, you're in charge. You're on the throne of my life. You're the king of my life. You're in charge. An Old Testament name for God is Adonai. It means master, Lord. And again, Western culture, no one's going to be my master. No one's going to tell me what to do. Yeah, and thank God for our freedom in America, but when it comes to God, who's in charge of your life? Make him king. This is what they did over 2,000 years ago, and this is what we can do today. And really, notice it means peace. So really, you and I know right now that peace is one of the greatest commodities in the world from a physical war standpoint with certain countries right now. Even more so around the world, people need internal peace. But the only way you and I have eternal peace is through Jesus, because it's only through Jesus that you and I can have peace. If we have everything we want or we have nothing, we can have peace because of who we have. Or in the middle of that, we can have peace. Or those that have everything or those that have nothing, uh, maybe they don't have peace. But the common denominator is those that have Jesus can have peace in spite of circumstances because in Christ, we have peace based on who he is, not on what we have. Please hear me. This is a major deal. God's not opposed to us having things. It's just that those things can't give us peace. Only Jesus can give us peace. He's the prince of peace. He's the captain of peace. He will give us perfect peace. He will give us peace that surpasses our understanding. It will guard our heart and mind. Hallelujah. When you and I make Jesus king, you and I can have peace and victory. So let me make this even simpler. What does it mean to have Jesus be king or make him king? That means he's number one in our life. And when he's number one, life will not be perfect, but life will be in order. When he's number one, we may not get everything we want, when we want it, how we want it, or how we understand it, but when he's number one, you and I can have order, and we can have peace, and we can have God's blessing on not just the first part with him, but two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way down the list of our life. God's not opposed to two through whatever. He's just saying, who's number one? That's what it means by making him king. In this passage, they used palm branches, and they were waving and worshiping as he came. They were singing. For us today, it's internal. So I want to ask you right now, who's king in your life? Who's number one? And really, for me and you in the room and online, all of us have to do this every day. This is not a one-time thing. We have to do this every day. Well, I did it 50 years ago. That's amazing. How about today? Well, today he's 10th. And let's be honest. Sometimes it feels like he's fluctuating because we're making him fluctuate. Where he wants to be is number one every day. It's a conscious decision. And you and I can make anything. We can make ourselves number one. We can make our spouse number one, our kids number one. We can make our kids sports number one, living through them and, their, and you know, fulfilling our dream. We can make money number one, being accepted number one, social media number one. We can make sex number one, alcohol, drugs, popularity, anything we want to make it, we can make it number one. It's just that if it's not God, we're going to always be unfulfilled. Hear me today. If you make yourself number one, you will be lonely. If you make someone else number one, you're going to be miserable because they will always disappoint you. If you make your kids number one, one day we hope they move out in Jesus' name. So they're going to be gone. And then... What's after that? Some people struggle with that. If you make money number one, it will never be enough. If you make fame number one, you'll always be reaching for a plateau you can never get because someone will always reject you. If you're reaching for it in alcohol and drugs, you hit it, you drink it, but guess what? You're left with the baggage of it and you're a prisoner to that thing. Whatever else it is outside of God, it does not satisfy and it does not give peace. Only God gives us peace. And some of you today, maybe in this room, I mean, you're saying, PD, I am so far away from God being number one in my life. I, 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 I'm so far from that. I can't even think about that. I would say take one step at a time. Let God, take, let, let God have your heart one step at a time and let Jesus begin to move in you and let Jesus help you 
And as the more you taste of God, the more you want to do this. And, and quite frankly, everyone hearing me right now has the capacity of making him number one. You have the ability to do that because something already in our life is number one. Let me tell you the human level of passion. 12 Kansas City chief football fans recently had to have parts of their body amputated because during the NFL playoffs, they all went to the game in Kansas City, which was the coldest in NFL history, minimum negative 20 for a football game and got frostbit. And a month later, they didn't recover. And 12 of them had to have parts of their body cut off for football. Humans have great capacity for passion into making something number one. Now, I'm not against football. We know that Jesus loves football. Jesus loves the Colts. You know why? I just read it. He rode the Colt. Jesus likes the Colts. He's not against football. He's not against money or marriage. He, he, he made man and woman to love each other and be married. All this, God made all this. He's not against any of it. It's just that who's number one? That's the, that's the battle that we have every day. Who's number one? And if people have the capacity to have this passion to even put their health on the line and, and then get their fingers or whatever it was cut off, good Lord, what if we just take this passion and say, God, I'm going to make you number one. I can have passion for running or working out or financial goals or that's fine. But, but, but man, I'm going to make you number one. I'm going to put you on top. Everyone can do it. In fact, these people, are, man, these people do marathons. Have you seen these people? They run 50 miles. They swim 50 miles. They climb a mountain, vomit, come down the mountain, vomit, get on a bike and vomit, drink water, eat like a little jello, vomit, run again, and then cramp and seize up, and, uh, and they do it again. They vomit. And they, these people are crazy. Who wants to do that? Passion, focus. You and I have the ability to put God number one. Let's make him king and put him number one. Now, the question is how? How? You being right now in this room or online, now, none of these make him number one, but the compilation of all of them help us stay focused on having God be the driving attention of our life. So being a part of a local church is huge because it helps us stay focused. It helps us stay in tune. It helps us stay with God in the forefront of our life. And really, I would say in the rhythm of our schedule, it's huge, very important. And then as we're a part of groups in the dream team, as we read the Bible, man, read the Bible, read one Bible verse every day. If that's all you got, do it. Or if you don't even have the strength to read the Bible, get a Bible app and have the Bible app read to you. Just do something. Let the word of God come on you. And then pray every day. You don't have to be spiritual to pray. Just say, Jesus, help me. And make it a part of the rhythm of your life. Even giving tithes and offerings, our, our, I would say the financial part of our faith. Yield it to God. It doesn't make God number one, but it helps us to keep him number one, that money or any other thing is not going to dictate my life. God leads my life. All these things and so much more help us to keep it focused in God, your number one. Who's your king today? Who's number one today? I pray it today you let Jesus take that, sp I take that spot. And when he's number one, number two, three, four, five, and all the way down can be blessed and in order with the hand of God. How many believe that's possible in Jesus? Come on, give him praise today. I believe that's possible. Oh, we have to choose it. So, the king and us, these people had a response to the king. They were available, and they made him king. I pray that today you and I would be available and be humble and be like that donkey and say, Jesus, sit on my shoulders. Let me lift you high so that people can see you all around me. I choose to make you number one. And the third thing is I see here is they worshiped God. In verse 9, I'm going to read this again. Jesus was in the center of the procession. The people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The whole city, the Bible said, was in an uproar. Another version in the gospel say that kids were shouting praises to God. 
Now, worship is important. I want to hit this on two things here before we go. First, worship is our lifestyle. Romans 12, verse 1, give your body as a living sacrifice. That's why God sees everything we do in private and in public. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You honor your body unto God physically, take care of it physically, sexually, take care of it, keep it clean. I believe if you're battling addiction today, Jesus can help you move forward. You can overcome it in Jesus' name. Anything in our life, your body is the temple. It's, it's God living in your body right now as we live on this earth. And one of one way we worship God is by our lifestyle. Now, Lord knows we're not perfect, right? For me, there's always post office, referees, um, plain stewardess, God help us all. They all challenge. It's always their fault, not mine. But the point is, just joking, we're not perfect. It's not about when I, you know, it's not my lifestyle being perfect because no one is perfect, but I'm just attempting to worship God by the way I live. In other words, the word of God leads my life. Not my rules, not grandma's rules, not the neighborhood rules, not the even our country's rules. God's way trumps all of it. I'm doing my life the way God said to do it. Now, this isn't always the easiest way, funnest way, or most convenient way, but it's the way that gives life and life more abundantly, and it's the way that heals us spirit, soul, and body and gives us fulfillment and peace. And this is the way Jesus wants. And so we worship God by just committing our lives as a lifestyle to say, God, I live for you. The second way we worship God is through our worship like we just did with singing and showing expressions to God and opening our heart. And, 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 and the Bible's full of verses of clap your hands, all ye people. Then it says, shout to God with the voice of triumph. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. I make a joyful noise. How about you? Most of us are making joyful noises when we sing. The Bible talks about physical expression. And I want to just encourage you, no matter where you're at in your faith, take it one step at a time. But if it's too much to step out and do something here in the room, do it in your shower, in your bathroom, at home, whatever you want to do. Just take one step and just sing with the worship song and praise God. Let yourself hear you sing to the Lord. And let God be lifted in your praises. Thank you for all the great applause back and amens in this room. I mean, it is good preaching anyhow. And, 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 and the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Say, well, I'm just uncomfortable. It's not my style. I've learned a long time ago that I'm not worshiping a style. I'm worshiping Jesus. So I've learned I can worship when someone plays the banjo. It's kind of challenging, but I can do it. I can worship with an organ or a guitar or no musical instruments. If we're worshiping, this is, I have a preference of style, but I'm worshiping Jesus. And I want to challenge all of us in this room and online that you would, would just take a step and just worship Jesus. They did. They were shouting praises to God. Praise God, son of David. Glory in the highest. Kids were shouting out, man, we're praising. And I was going to, and just follow me on this. You and I can do this because wherever our heart is open, expression follows. Think about that. Wherever we open our heart to someone or something, expression follows. When I fell in love with Summer, man, my, my expression started coming through. I love you. You're my girl. And she would say, I know. Let's get married today. I'm like, slow down, girl. We've got to wait a little bit. And so finally, I just said, fine, I'll marry you. That's how that happened. I, I, I'm, that, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But when I, when I opened my heart, my, the expressions of my love came through me. We went to a Boys to Men concert, and I was singing to her. They had me come on the stage. I was the fourth man in the band. On the we go to the end of the road till I It's a natural. They didn't call me on the stage, but I did. I did. I did. I turned to her. I turned to her and I was singing to her. She was like, shut up. It's like, no, although we go. 
We went to the Journey concert. My, my heart was open, so my expressions followed. I was singing to her when they were playing Faithfully. I'm going to sing it to her. I'm forever yours, faithfully. Now, 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 now. She was all embarrassed. But my heart, my expressions follow. Hear me. When you and I open our heart to God, our expressions follow. I want to encourage you, open your heart to Jesus. If you're closed off to Jesus, man, he's the best friend you will ever need and you will ever have. He is the one. He's the miracle worker, the way maker, promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. He is the bread of heaven. He's the good shepherd of our souls. He is Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God. He is the lily in the valley. He's the bright star. He's the morning star. He's your redeemer. He's your deliverer. He's your healer. He is your king. Open your heart to him and let expression follow. So start wherever you're at, but this is what these people did 2,000 plus years ago, and this is what we can do today more internal today. It's not necessarily palm branches, and, but the singing part is external too. But I want to encourage you that you and I would choose to be available. You and I would choose to make him king, and you and I would choose to worship him. And it's the king and us. And we say, God, I'm yours. And in my lifetime, I choose to be humble. Whatever you want to do, use me. There's so many things competing for the number one spot in my life and in my heart. I have to guard it every day, like all of us. But every day, you're number one. And the reason why I live is to worship you. Because without you, I wouldn't be here. You predestined me and created me to be here right now in human history. You're my creator and my God, and I have to worship you. Without you, I'm nothing. With you, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I want to encourage you today, let God lead you and help you and take one step at a time. Bow your heart and bow your head to heaven in this room and online, please. We're not here to embarrass you. We're here to help you move forward in your faith. And if you've never received Jesus, meaning you've never out loud with your mouth said, Jesus, save me, then I pray today is your day on Palm Sunday 2024. Maybe you've done that, but for whatever reason, you've drifted away from God and you feel and know that God's calling you back to him. Online, if this is you today, let the online host know that you're making this decision. But right now, you would say, Pastor Dave, I've never received Christ and or I have, but I need to come back to God and make him Lord of my life. Now is my moment. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand in this moment. I want to pray for you in this room. God bless you today. Good. God bless you. God bless you. Excellent. God bless you. God bless you. Excellent. God bless you. Good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Excellent. God bless you. Come on, give it up. People coming to Jesus today. God bless you. Good. And then you would say, you know, you know, Pastor Dave, when I think about my life, we all deal with pride. No one, no one is free from pride in this room and online. I'm free from pride. That tells me you have pride. <laughs> so we all have to wrestle with that because we have to make a conscious decision of humility. And you would say, Pastor Dave, pray for me. I want to be available to God. Maybe all three are just one of the three, but I want to be available to God. I want the help to make him king in my life, number one. And then I want the strength to worship him in my lifestyle and with my expression. I want to give God what I have. If that's you today, raise your hand. I want to support you and pray for you. God bless you. Hands up all over. Good. Follow me in this prayer so no one's left out and say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours and I run to you. Please forgive me for anything that's wrong in my life. I turn from that. I say yes to you. I choose to make you Lord of my life. I do life your way. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, help me be available Help me make you king. Help me to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give it up one more time for all the people that see Christ today.